Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's uh, session. Just uh, want to remind you uh, that uh, to put your name and your class. Uh, if you are a long young student, please put your name and your class uh, in the live chat so that I can take attendance. Uh, and uh, if you are here from another school, uh, please uh, tell us your name and also which school you are from uh, so that we can get to know you better. Okay, just uh, secondly, I want to do a short sound check, okay, just to make sure that uh, the sound is okay. Uh, if it is okay, just uh, let me know in the in the comments, uh, sorry, in the live chat, okay, uh, so that uh, I can start the class. Okay, uh, just let me know, I'll wait for you. <coughs> okay. So today, we are going to continue our study on uh, the topic of radioactivity. Okay, and um, I'm going to start sharing this screen with all of you. Okay, so whenever we talk about radioactivity, okay, uh, again, uh, it's good for us to remember uh, where we stopped, okay, uh, where we are in our journey and then uh, where we stopped. Uh. Okay, so uh, we have covered this part. Okay, which is uh, the nucleus of an atom. Okay, we talked about how to write the composition of a nucleus. The top number must be the nucleon number. The bottom number must be the proton number. Okay, and then after that, we went on to talk about radioactive decay. And we learned in the previous lesson that there are three types of decays. Okay, there are three types of decays, uh, which is the alpha decay, the beta decay, and the gamma decay. Both the alpha and beta decay produce particles, okay, uh, sorry, emit, no, not produce, they emit particles, okay, the alpha particle is a helium atom, which is a helium-4-2, okay, and then the beta particle is an electron, which is electron 0 and minus 1, okay, the reason why it is minus 1 is because electrons are negatively charged, okay, we know that the bottom number, okay, in the composition of a nucleus always refers to the number of protons they are, so to balance it out, we will say that the electron carries, okay, with it, a negative one charge, okay? And after that, we talked about uh, certain characteristics of each radioactive emission, okay? For, as, and we were talking specifically uh, about the ionizing power and the penetrating power. And all this, the ionizing power and penetrating power, all has to do with uh, the mass, Okay, uh, how heavy it is uh, determines uh, why its ionizing power is high or why its penetrating power is high. Okay, and we established in the last lesson uh, that between the three, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, okay, alpha has the highest ionizing power okay, because it moves very slowly. Okay, therefore, it can ionize all the air around it. Okay, and we will soon see in a while uh, 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 an example of uh, Okay, of how ionizing air looks like. Okay, whereas penetrating power, we find that since gamma is, you know, the lightest of the three, okay, between helium and electron and gamma, okay, gamma, gamma is just an electromagnetic wave, right? it's just a ray. Okay, so it has the biggest uh, penetrating power because it's able to move very fast. Okay, and we said that they, since, it's, since it is an electromagnetic wave, okay, uh, gamma moves with the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Okay, whereas the slowest of them all is helium, but because helium is very heavy, uh, there are 2 protons and 2 neutrons in helium. So it's very, very heavy, okay, compared to, uh, compared to gamma rays. Okay, and then uh, of course, after that, we also talked about, uh, you know, how to do calculations, uh, how to do the radioactive decay series, uh, Okay, which uh, we already covered in the last lesson. Uh. So today, what we're going to do, what we're going to focus on is on two things, uh, two main things, uh, or three, three, sorry. The first one is I want to talk about radioactive detectors. Okay, what are the instruments, uh, apa alat-alat yang kita pakai untuk mengesan ke radioaktifan? Okay, how do we detect radioactivity? What are the instruments that we use? Secondly, we're going to talk about half-life. Okay, and this one is another calculation part, lah, which is a little bit more complicated than the one that we were doing previously. Okay, we're talking about half-life, and since we're talking about half-life, we must talk about the decay curve. 
And then finally, we will go into some applications of radioisotopes. Okay, we will talk about what radioisotopes are and how they are used. Okay, uh, in industries, in everyday life, in uh, medicine, okay, uh, in technology today. Okay, and then we will call it a day. All right, so I just want to give you a brief overview of what we're about to do today. Okay, so that you can mentally be prepared for what's coming. Okay, so since we talked about the three alpha, beta, and gamma uh, decays, okay, so we find that in every decay, okay, it is a spontaneous and a random, uh, you know, emission of uh, radioactive particles. Okay, it's spontaneous and random because we don't know where and we don't know how and we don't know when it's going to happen. Okay, but when it happens, okay, there is going to be some radiation that's going to be emitted. So we need uh, instruments uh, to tell us, oh, okay, there's radioactivity going on here. Okay, and the point of it is to protect ourselves. Lah. Okay, because, uh, you know, since we don't know what, what kind of radiation is going to happen, we cannot take the chance uh, and just, oh, okay, lah, lah, I'm sure it's going to be alpha, lah, the least dangerous of them all. No, okay, even alpha is still dangerous, but of course not as dangerous as gamma lah, for us. Lah. Okay, so in order to keep ourselves safe, in order to protect ourselves, we need to have all these radioactive detectors. Okay, and today we're going to look at some of them. Lah. The first detector is what we call a gold leaf electroscope. Okay, dalam bahasa Inggris, uh, sorry, dalam bahasa Melayu is called uh, electroscope kerajang emas. I think that's what it's called. Okay, but basically it is a metal disc over here. Okay, and then there's this, the electroscope part is over here. Lah. Okay, so we find that when the electroscope is charged, okay, actually we use this uh, to determine charges. Okay, to determine if something uh, is being charged or not. Okay, so when an electroscope is charged, okay, the gold leaf uh, will stick out. Okay, they akan terkeluar, they akan terkeluar begitu lah. Okay, so, you know, because the charges on the gold repel the charges on the metal stock. Okay, so when there's a charge over here, then since this is all connected, Okay, so there will be charges over here, so the gold leaf uh, will repel. Okay, we studied this in chapter 2. Lah. If you have two same charges, kan, they are menolak. Okay, so when the radioactive source comes near, that the first situation is kalau kita pakai charge. Lah. For example, if let's say uh, you, take a, you take a ruler, uh, then you rub, claw off, or it, kan, then you become charged. Ma. So when you put it on the metal base, okay, then the gold leaf will be sorry, Okay, if it is charged. Lah, okay, but... Now we're not talking about charges, we're talking about radioactive sources. So when a radioactive source comes near, the air is ionized, okay, and starts to conduct electricity. Okay, this means the charge can leak away. Okay, and we find that if there is a radioactive source, uh, okay, the air around it is ionized. So the charges now uh, will move up. Okay, which makes this gold leaf move this way. It will go nearer and nearer to the this one because you know there's the, the force of repelling, uh, okay, the pushing force against one another is already lesser. So it will come near to one another. Okay? But I need to say that the gold leaf electroscope can only detect alpha particles. Okay? We will come to that in a while at the end. Lah. Okay? Not every detector can detect all three. Okay? Actually, but in the case of the gold leaf electroscope, because it mainly works on positive charges, uh, and we know that, Alpha particle is the only one that emits positive charges. Okay, so the gold leaf electroscope is the only, uh, I mean, it only detects alpha particles. So if you have a radioactive source and it's emitting gamma rays or, or uh, electrons, uh, especially gamma rays, uh, since it has no charge at all, uh, okay, the gold leaf will be like, hmm, okay, nothing, because it's not affected at all. Okay, the gold leaf electroscope works mainly on the interaction between charges. Okay, so we find that if there's a radioactive source, especially if it's alpha, we find that the gold leaf will go nearer. Okay, uh, it won't repel. Okay, so that's the first uh, detector. Okay, the second detector is a more famous detector. It's called a cloud chamber. Okay, so what you have over here is, uh, you have this dry ice. Okay, and then we put some alcohol over here. Okay, the foam is to support the dry eyes. Lah. Okay, and then uh, what happens? You have this radioactive source over here. Okay, and then this felt ring, uh, okay, this part over here is soaked in alcohol. Okay, this all these four parts over here 
is also an alcohol so that you know and we know that alcohol uh, they you know they dapat meruak dengan cepat so you will find that after a while when you close everything and since there's dry ice over here the point of the dry ice is, is to cool the alcohol vapor okay so so what happens uh, is that all this vapor all this alcohol vapor will be all around here Okay, and if you put a lamp here, okay, what you're going to see is that the, the radioactive source uh, is going to ionize the alcohol vapor. Okay, and then the type of ionization that we see, uh, okay, the type of ionization that we see will tell us what kind of uh, radiation they are. Okay, so I'm just going to read this. It shows the path traveled by the ionizing radiation in the air. The radioactive produces ions in the air that is saturated with alcohol vapor. So the alcohol vapor condenses on the ions to make the tracks of the radiation visible. Alpha particles are the best because the ionization power is high. Of the three, uh, actually, the cloud chamber can detect all three. It's just that it is most obvious uh, for alpha particle because, as I said, alpha particle, the ionizing power is very high. Okay, they are mampu untuk mengionkan uh, udara. Okay, and in this case, it can ionize the alcohol vapor very easily. Okay, now to show you an example of how it looks like, how this ionizing looks like, okay, I once did a, an experiment, not an experiment, uh, we once tried to come up with a, a simple cloud chamber, uh, okay, with a very weak radioactive source, okay, and then this is uh, what we saw. So, uh, there's no sound to this, so, uh, so don't worry about this. Okay, let me see. Okay, so take a look at this video. Huh? Okay, you're gonna see. Okay, you're gonna see all this. You no, know, you see that. You know, it looks like worms moving around, but actually, it's not. Huh? It is actually the air being ionized. Okay, it is the air being ionized, and you find that some of the air being ionized, huh? like for example, uh, okay, for example, like this. Huh? this one looks like cloudy, cloudy, like like very weak. Whereas some, huh, they're shooting very fast. Okay, they're shooting very fast. You know and like very easily ionized okay and those the ones are uh, that are very straight and they're shooting very fast now uh, okay those are the alpha particles okay that's the job of the alpha particles okay and then of course the slightly weaker ones that look like you know curly curly clouds uh, those are the job of beta particles okay so uh, over here it's very hard to see the gamma i don't think we saw the gamma when we did this uh, okay but uh, this is how the cloud chamber will look like if there's a radioactive source inside. Okay, so I'm going to show you this again. Okay, take a look, especially at the last second, uh, the very obvious alpha over there. Now, nah, again, yeah. oh, sorry, Alamak. Okay, sorry, let's show this again. Okay, very obvious alpha particle that you can see over there. One. Okay, right at the last second that you can see. There, this one. Okay, do you see this? Uh, Okay. you see this one over here very obvious alpha okay because it's very nice very straight okay and um, yeah so I know uh, I know that I said that you know the helium particle moves the slowest uh, but it doesn't mean that, that it's moving like a turtle okay it is still much faster than what we imagine it to be like Chuma compared to gamma rays uh, which are moving at the speed of light uh, okay the helium particle actually is moving very slowly Okay, but this is a very obvious alpha ionization. Okay, manakala yang runut, yeah, sorry, yang yang keli keli macam ni kan? Ah, uh, this is uh, more of a you know beta particle lah. Okay, because it's weaker, it's not so you know it's not so it's not so visibly seen lah. Okay, so so yeah, so that's an example of what you would probably see yeah, in a cloud chamber. Okay, so that's the second one. Right, the third one is a more famous one. Uh, the third one is what we call the Geiger-Muller tube. Okay, the Geiger-Muller tube, uh, which people have, uh, you know, they have uh, changed it uh, and now it becomes a Geiger counter. Uh. But basically how it works, uh, how the Geiger counter or how the Geiger-Muller tube works uh, is like this. Uh. So the radioactive emission enters the tube, okay, through the Mika window, which is here, and ionizes the neon gas. Okay, so we find out uh, that actually it is because of uh, it is because of the the characteristic uh, of the the radioactive, the ability to ionize uh, is what enables us uh, to to create all these detectors. Okay, so 
The electrons and positive ions are attracted towards the anode and cathode respectively. We have talked about this. The electrons will be uh, will be attracted to the the, po the positive uh, charge. Sorry, the positive uh, terminal. Okay, and the positive ions, which is the helium, will be attracted to the negative terminal. So when the electrons are collected by the anode, okay, which is here, okay, a pulse of current is produced. Okay, the pulse of current is counted by a scalar or rate meter. The scalar gives the number of counts over a certain period of time. So we find that our uh, Geiger Müller tube, uh, the unit la, uh, okay, actually uh, nowadays they use this unit called sievert uh, SV la. Uh. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna write this in my span. Uh. The short form is SV, okay, but at the real spelling uh, is S I E V E R T. Okay, the unit for uh, radioactivity uh, Okay, it's called sievert. Most Geiger counters uh, they will use sievert lah. Uh. Okay, but uh, the Geiger Müller tube, or actually in the past we use, we call it as counts per minute, okay, or counts per second, depending on the setting of the Geiger Müller tube. Okay, so of course the bigger the count uh, means the more radioactive, uh, the, the the more you know radioactive presence there is uh. Okay, so initially when the okay this is an important thing uh, initially when the GM tube is switched on, whenever we turn on a Geiger counter or whenever we turn turn on a GM tube. Uh, Okay, and there's and there's we feel uh, that we are nowhere near any radioactive substance. Okay, we actually expect the reading to be zero, uh, okay, because there's no radioactivity. Okay, but there is going to be some activity. Okay, because the reading displayed, uh, okay, I'm gonna stress this uh, very, very much. Okay, the reading displayed by the rate meter is known as the background count rates. No matter what, uh, you actually cannot run away from radioactivity. Because our biggest source of radiation uh, is actually the sun. Okay, the sun, uh, which we depend on every day, okay, is actually our biggest source of radiation. But of course, yeah, lah, because of our distance with the sun, the radiation count is very low. Okay, we won't die, lah, okay. Sometimes uh, people have this uh, very bad misconception. Uh, it's like we must not connect any radiation at all. Otherwise, kalau kena sikit pun terus mati. Oh, uh, hello. Every day when you go under the sun. Okay. For people who have been cheerleading, uh, you have been read, you have been under the radiation exposure for so much. Okay, so and I don't see you all dying, lah. So okay, so obviously the background count uh, is very small, but we cannot deny that it is there. Okay, there is going to be some reading. If you go, if you turn on the Geiger counter or the Geiger Müller tube, uh, and you find that the reading is zero, uh, most likely your Geiger counter is wrong. Stop. Okay, because it is impossible for it to be zero. Okay, there must be some background reading. Okay, so I want to write here, background radiation gives reading to the GM tube even though there is no radioactive source. Okay, and there are a few, uh, there are two main sources of the background radiation. Okay, number one is natural radioactivity in the ground, the bricks, or the building. Doesn't matter whether kamu tinggal di rumah kampung ka, rumah batu ka, apa-apa, Okay, there's definitely going to be some background radiation. Of course, rumah batu will have a lot more lah, compared to rumah kayu. Lah. Okay, but those of you who are staying in your big, big bungalows, okay, uh, remember your big, big bungalow also is still made out of bricks. Okay, and it is a building. So definitely got some background radiation. The second source of background radiation is cosmic radiation, which is what I said just now, lah, the radiation from the sun. Okay, if you remember your science from three, uh, you have learned that solar flares Okay, solar flares in the sun uh, uh, produce a lot of radiation and some of the radiation comes to us. Lah. Okay, but thank God now uh, we are far enough from the sun, okay, not to feel the, you know, the big brunt of the radiation. Okay, of course, the first planet, memang dia akan terasa paling banyak. Lah. Okay, so please know this now, uh, whenever you turn on the Geiger counter, there's going to be some reading. And the reading is called background radiation. And the two sources of background radiation are natural radioactivity and cosmic radiation. Okay, or radiation from the sun. Okay, now when the GM tube is used to detect radiative emission, the background count rate is subtracted so that you find out the real, the real uh, reading okay, of the radiation. Okay, so that's the Geiger Müller tumor. Oh yes, I forgot to mention just now uh, that if you have any questions, okay, if you have any questions uh, regarding our lesson today, just put it in the live chat, okay, and then uh, I will answer it only at the end, uh, okay. All right, 
The next one now is called a spark counter. Okay, so so far we've covered three. So far we've covered three, right? The first one is uh, electroscope. The second one is cloud chamber. The third one is Geiger Müller tube. Okay, the fourth the fourth one is called a spark counter. Okay, the spark counter is just a wire gauze. Okay, and a thin wire underneath it. Okay, then we put very high voltage, and it's usually about five thousand volts. Huh? Okay, so a high voltage is applied between the gauze and the wire. So the voltage is adjusted until it is just below the value to be re uh, required to produce sparks. Okay, in this case over here, they put it as 5,000 volts. So when you have a radioactive source, okay, again, uh, the radiation ionizes the air. Okay, and we know that if there is an iron, okay, if the air is iron, uh, means electricity is going to flow. Okay, so the motion of the ions to the gauze and the wire causes sparks to be produced. So if I put the radioactive source near the spark counter, we're going to see a lot of sparks now. Over here. Okay, so it's going to be sparking here. Wow, it's the first time I'm seeing this word sparking. But okay, fine, sparking. Okay, and we can see the sparks. Okay, you will actually hear, you will see the sparks because they're just lava time. So it's going to pop, 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 pop. And then you're going to hear it. Okay, you're going to see. Okay, and we find that spark counters are very suitable for alpha particles. Again, because the ability of the alpha particles to ionize the air around it okay, is very important. Remember, when, it become, when we ionize the air, the air becomes ion. Okay, the air becomes ion means it is not a neutral atom anymore. It is either a positive or negative charge. Okay, and it, because it is charged, okay, electricity can flow. And that's what causes the sparks. Okay, beta particles and gamma rays produce too few ions. Okay, because you know we say that beta and gamma, the ionizing power is very low. Okay, so spark counter is actually uh, suitable for uh, alpha. Beta also can la, okay, but it's very weak. Gamma is uh, gamma, gamma is can. I think can. Okay, but also very weak. Okay, now the most common detector, okay, and probably the cheapest la, The most common detector is oh, is called the photographic batch. Okay, anybody who works in a nuclear facility has to wear a badge that looks like this. Okay, and uh, so they work in nuclear power stations and in radiation laboratories. Okay, so the badge contains a photographic film, okay, in a light proof packet. So there's a film over here. Okay, this red color piece uh, is a piece of photographic film. If you remember, you know, the old films that we have, uh, uh, it's the same thing as a photographic film. Okay. So we find that, okay, if you remember how photographic, the old photography works, uh, when it is exposed to light, okay, then it will become, you know, it will become darker, uh, okay, it will become very black. Okay, so the parts, number three, uh, the parts of the film which had received radiation will be darkened. The degree of darkening indicates the amount of radiation the person has been exposed to. Okay, so if, if there's a lot of uh, radiation, uh, then the, the photography will be very, very black. Okay, And if you notice over here from the side view, uh, the first one is lead and then the second one is aluminium. Okay, And we know okay, that if it is lead, okay, then we know that this section over here, okay, I'm just sorry. Uh, da -da -da, stop, yeah. okay. Let's say if I divide this into three parts, lah. Okay, this section, this section, and then this section. Okay. And then you think about it. If let's say uh, I have an alpha, alpha radiation. Uh, okay, alpha radiation will definitely be over here. Okay. It will not it will be stopped by this aluminium, but and definitely be stopped by this lead. Uh, okay, it won't pass through. So this part will be already black. Okay. If I have a beta radiation, okay, I'm gonna change the color. I'm gonna use green for beta. Okay, green is beta is definitely gonna hit here. Okay. And again, it's going to be stopped here. And again, it's going to be stopped here. Okay, because we know that beta can be stopped by uh, a few pieces, uh, no, a few millimeters of aluminium. Okay, but what about gamma? Okay, if there is gamma, okay, I'm going to change the color to blue. Okay, blue for gamma. Definitely here also will have luck. Okay, and here also will have. Okay, because gamma can penetrate through aluminium. Okay, and this one will not have. It will not have anything. Okay, so we find out that okay, 
if there is all three, uh, then this side uh, will be significantly much darker. Okay? And if this is very dark, then we need to see this next part. Uh, we need to see whether there is gamma. Because if there's gamma people, then this person called J. Smith uh, will need to run away uh, as soon as he can. Okay? Because gamma radiation is very dangerous to us. Okay? So this is uh, the examples uh, okay, of certain effects. Of course, there are more than just five. Uh, Okay, but I think five is enough. Now, just to show you a short summary yeah, okay, of what can be detected and what can't. Okay, so we find that the photographic plate or the photographic batch can detect all three, just like the Geiger Muller tube and also the cloud chamber. Now, I'm saying that just now when we were looking at the video, the cloud chamber can easily detect alpha and beta. I'm not saying that it cannot detect gamma, it's just a little bit more difficult to see with the naked eye. But definitely the one that cannot lie. Okay, for is spark counter. Uh, spark counter can only detect uh, detect alpha particle because you know, the ionizing power of alpha particle is very high. Manakala for gold leaf electroscope, as I said just now, since it works on charges, uh, okay, it depends on whether the particle has a charge. Definitely gamma ray cannot because gamma ray is no charge. Okay, alpha particle can because the ionizing power is high, but beta particle also can, but it will take a very long time. Okay, it will take a very long time and actually the gold leaf will, uh, will be repelled. Okay, so it's good for us to know uh, among these five uh, detectors, okay, which one can detect alpha, which one can detect beta, and which one can detect gamma. Okay, but if you really want to remember this the easiest, just remember the gold leaf and the spark counter. Spark counter is the best. Spark counter can only do one only. Okay, and the reason is because the ionizing power of alpha is very high. And spark counter depends on that. Okay, gold leaf can only do two, but even the beta particle takes a long time. Gamma definitely cannot because there's no charge. And the gold leaf electroscope works primarily uh, uh, on the charges. Okay, the other three can detect all three. Okay, so you don't need to be very scared. Uh. Okay, but of course the Geiger Muller tube is probably the basis for our Geiger counter today. Okay. Nowadays, I know, nowadays uh, we use all these digital, digital alat lah. Okay? So there is a detector inside and then uh, if you watch the movies, uh, they'll be like... Tar -tar 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 okay, so yeah, so it is all uh, you know, an extension of this. But this was the basic stuff, okay, that people used uh, in the past uh, to, to, to figure out, you know, whether there's radiation uh, in the air or not. Okay, so... I'm just going to stop here for a while and see if there's any questions uh, from anybody. Okay, so far there's no questions except for... <laughs> okay, except for from Tong. La, okay, will there be Geiger counter? Uh, Geiger counter is actually the extension of Geiger Muller tube. Okay, so... And Geiger counter is basically digitized. So, you know, there's not really that much for us to explore as to how it works. La. Okay, but it's a uh, good design. Um, I don't know what looks like a PS2 spark starting screen, uh, but okay, fine. Okay, uh, it's not sparky, uh, it's sparking. Okay, I'm also first time hearing this word sparking. Okay, producing sparks is called sparking. So, yeah, all right, let's continue. Uh. Okay, next thing we need to talk about is half life. Okay, so this is the second part of today's lecture uh, or lecture webinar. Okay, so the next part that we need to talk about is about half-life. Now, half-life, okay, is defined uh, as the time required, okay, how much time you need uh, for the mass or the activity or the number of nuclei, okay, nucleus, uh, okay, bilangan nucleus, uh, okay, of a radioactive substance to fall to half of its initial value. Okay, now this is a very loaded definition. Huh? So I'm going to erase everything and remind you once again. Okay, since all these lines are not very helpful, I'm going to highlight it. Huh? I'm going to highlight it in different, different colors. So the first one is time required. Second one is, the second thing that I will elaborate on is, oh no, I cannot, cannot use this color. Uh, okay. For the mass, activity, and number of nuclei. Okay, and the third one is okay, fall to half 
of its initial value. Okay, these are the three main keywords uh, that we need to talk about when we talk about half-life. Okay, half-life uh, is the amount of time, okay, amount of time, okay, for either one of these, either the mass, okay, means, uh, you know, 100 grams, 200 grams, okay, or the activity, yeah, okay, activity is a very new kind of unit now, okay, but activity, if you remember our Geiger Muller tube just now, well, we find that, you know, the Geiger Muller tube, the unit for the radiation is considered as counts per second, okay, how much radiation per second, so counts per second, this is known as the activity, Okay, bukan activity kokum, uh, okay, it's not that kind of activity, but you know, it's the activity of the radioactive substance. Okay, otherwise known as the counts per second. Or the number of nucleus. Okay, maybe, you know, originally there's 100 nucleus. Okay, after a certain time, uh, they are kind of less. Lah. Okay, because remember, we were talking about this. As it decays, uh, the nucleus will become smaller and smaller. Okay, so... Uh, that's what we mean by the number of nuclei, okay, of a radioactive substance to, okay, this is the important thing, to fall to half of its initial value, half of the original mass, half of the original activity, half of the original number of nucleus. The amount of time uh, it takes to fall from the original to half of its original value, okay? Let's say if the original one uh, is 100 grams, Okay, then decay, 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 then finally we get 50 grams. So the amount of time uh, it takes to travel from travel, sorry, the amount of time uh, okay, it takes to decay from 100 grams to 50 grams is known as the half life. Okay, notice, uh, okay, I'm not talking about half the time, uh, I'm talking about half the mass, half the activity, half the number of nucleus. Okay, the time required for it to achieve, to decay until become half of the original value, that's the half-life. Okay, now it is, actually it is not taught uh, in your books. Uh. Uh, right now what they're teaching you is the half-life, the symbol is T half. Okay, the official symbol now is T half. Uh. When I was studying this last time, half-life uh, was actually this sign which now we use as wavelength lah. Okay, lambda. Okay, last time we last time when I was learning this, okay, the symbol for half-life is actually lambda. Okay, but because of the confusion between lambda half-life and lambda wavelength, I guess people think that maybe students these days don't know how to differentiate between Greek letters lah. So they make it into a more simple version that is accessible to everybody, which is called T half. Okay, but the meaning doesn't change. Okay. If, I'm not sure if you're a gamer, but last time there was a game called Half Life, and then the main symbol of, uh, sorry, the main, yeah, the main symbol of the Half Life was this lambda sign. So everybody knew if they saw the sign, then they knew they're talking about the game called Half Life. Yeah, I don't even know whether people play Half Life anymore. Or not, sorry. Okay, but anyway, for us, for our all intents and purposes, okay, we will refer to Half Life as T half. Okay, the boring symbol. Okay, I like lambda because it looks more cool. Okay, so T half, uh, okay, is the time required, T for time, uh, the amount of time required for the mass to decay until become half of the original value. Okay, and we find uh, that the half-life is always the same. Okay, let's look at this one, uh, how to determine the half-life from a decay curve. So this is a decay curve. Okay, we find that, you know, if somebody plots, uh, Okay, if somebody plots the activity or the mass of a radioactive substance against time, we find that as time goes by, this is how the graph will look like. Okay, so we find that originally, the activity is 256. Okay, get used to this word, huh? the activity is 256. Means there's 256 counts of radioactivity per second. Okay, and then after as time goes by, half of 256 huh, is 128. Okay, 1, 2, 5, 6 divided by 2 is 1, 2, 8. Uh. And we find that the time it takes uh, to travel from, sorry, to decay from 2, 5, 6 to 1, 2, 8 is 3 hours. Okay, not necessarily seconds or, or minutes. It uh. can be hours, can be days, can be years. Okay, take a look at the unit properly. Uh. So, in that sense, the half-life, uh, because of that, the half-life is 3 hours. 
Now, if I'm going to extend this, uh, okay, so originally is 2, 5, 6. Okay, after 3 hours, okay, after 1 half life, this is the reason why I don't like to write this. Okay, after 1 half life, it becomes 1, 2, 8. Okay, my question to you is, after another half life, okay, that means after another 3 hours, lah, okay, what does the activity become? Okay, guys, it is not 2, 5, 6, minus 1, 2, 8, and then you minus the same thing. Huh? No, huh? it doesn't work that way. It is divided by 2. Okay, it is always divide 2, divide 2. It becomes 2, half, 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 people. Okay, this word half uh, makes people very scared. Okay, because it's always divided by 2, not minus. Okay, because this graph is not a linear graph. Huh? Okay, it is a curve. Okay, so because of that, we have to divide it by 2. So 2, 5, 6 divided by 2 is 1, 2, 8. 1, 2, 8 divided by 2 is 64. Okay, so after 6 hours, okay, this is 3 hours, this is 3 hours. After 6 hours, the, the activity here will become 64. So 1, 2, 8 divided by 2, let's say 64 is about here. Okay, okay so we find that the 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 Okay, we find that it becomes 64. Okay, divided by 2, not minus 1 to 8. Okay, never make this mistake. It becomes half of the original value. Another t half, after another 3 hours, okay, the 64 will become what? Divide by 2 again, 32. Okay, after another half, 3, 6, 9, after 12 hours, the 32 will become how much? 16. Okay. After another half life, 16 will become 8. After another half life, will become 4. After another half life, okay, you can see that I'm going in circles, uh, 2. After another half life, become 1. After another half life, half of 1 is 0.5. After another half life, this is getting ridiculous, lah, but I just want to show you this point. 0 0.5, half of 0 0.5 is how much? Is 0 0.25. After another half life, okay, half of 0 0.25 is 0 0.125. After another half life, okay, so you look, uh, originally we had 256, okay, and it looks like we're going towards zero, right? But guys, the reality is it will never reach zero. Okay, because the half of anything cannot be zero. The only thing that half of something becomes zero is zero. But it's not possible because it's not going to reach zero. You continue on, like, you just divide by two, divide by two, divide by two, divide by two, or you will never reach zero. You will come close to zero. Maybe zero point zero 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 zero, but you will never reach zero. Which is why this graph, uh, this decay curve, uh, will after a while will kind of flatten out but it will never reach zero okay because that's how half life works it will always decay to become half 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 but it will never totally disappear okay and that's how radioactivity works and that's how uh, our this one works okay but you know and this number two five six uh, can be activity can be mass can be number of nuclei okay i can even say that uh, as a percentage you know Okay, let's say I, if I, yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to rub everything. Huh? Let's say if I use percentage, lah, okay, I don't know how much my original mass is, okay, but I want to count how many percent is left. Okay, can, I can still use the same thing. Sorry, huh? this rubbing is more difficult than it looks. Okay, so let's say originally uh, is 100%. Of course, yeah, lah. so my original one is 100%. Okay, after one half life, it becomes 100 divided by 2, 50%. After another half life, 50 divided by 2, 25. Guys, notice uh, it's not 100 minus 50 minus 50, no. Okay, half life is, and you're not going to like this, half life is a geometric progression. Okay, it will never reach zero and it will never be negative. Okay, because it is a geometric progression. So it's divided by two or times half, lah. Times half, times half, times half. 
okay, times 0 0.5. So 25 divided by 2, 12.5. 12.5 divided by 2, 6. 6.25. 6.25 divided by 2, 3.125%. Okay, sorry, I was using percent uh, from the beginning. Uh. Okay, still counts. Okay, if my, I, and I don't know how much my original, all I know is, okay, originally I had 100% of the radioactive substance. Okay, after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, after 5 half lives, I will only have 3.125% percent of the original substance uh, left. Okay, that's also another way to count it. So there are many ways of looking at it. But the main point is this. It is called half-life uh, because it is the time required. It is the life okay, that you require for it to fall to half of its value. Okay, I know life, fine. And we cannot call it half-time uh, because half-time means a very different thing. To people who play football, to people who play rugby, half-time is a totally different thing. Okay, which is why maybe I think the physicist last time said, okay, let's not call it half-time because everybody will confuse it with, with uh, football. Okay, so we call it half-life. Okay, sounds much cooler and people can make a game out of it. Wow. Okay, so it's called half-life. It is the amount of time for it to fall to half of its original value. Okay, and we can, deter we can determine it from either a decay series like this or from a curve. Okay. I am spending a significant amount of time explaining this because this is a very important part in radioactivity. Okay, knowing how to count the half life. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of questions. Okay, I want you to take a look at the questions, uh, and then we will listen. Now. Okay, the radioactive atoms in a substance decay to become stable atoms. Okay, it was found that after two hundred and eighty-eight seconds. Now, percent to the 6.25% of the atoms have not decayed. Maksudnya, yang balance uh, is 6.25%. Now, whenever you have percent, we always start with 100%. Okay? So, let's half-life it. Lah. After 100%, becomes 50%. After 50%, it becomes 25%. After 25%, it becomes 12.5%. After 12.5%, divide by 2 again, you find that you finally reach 6.25%. Okay? Now, guys, I, I, yeah, I probably didn't mention this just now. This, lepas half-life card, ini yang baki, ya, okay, ini yang tertinggal. Okay? Which is this, lah, have not decayed. Lah. So, after one half-life, 50% haven't decayed. After two half lives, 25% haven't decayed. Maksudnya, dia masih lagi di sana. Yang lain semua sudah lari. Okay, already like, you know, admitted to go somewhere else. Okay, so we find that the amount of, the number of half lives, uh, okay, that has passed in order for 100% to become 6.25 is 1, 2, 3, 4. So, 4 half lives. Okay, so 4 half lives, okay, is... 288 seconds. 288 seconds. So, how much is, how long, sorry, how long is one half life? 288 divided by 4, you will get 72 seconds. Okay. 72 seconds is pretty fast, uh, if you think about it. Every minute, poof, every minute, sorry, every minute, uh, you will have decayed until half of it. Then the next minute, you will decay and then become half. Guys, I want you to understand this. Uh, that when we talk about decay, okay, if you take a look at the graph, uh, they are broken. Oh, okay, originally 256. Three hours later, poof, okay, 128 gone. No, uh, it's not that. Uh, it's just, you know, decay, 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 and then three hours later, tinggal 128. Okay, it is not uh, every three hours, one explosion. Okay, not like that. Uh, it's not like this. Uh, it's not like every 72 seconds, uh, boom. Okay, 50% left. Then boom. It's not one big bang like that. Okay, it is a decay. Okay, they must have kikis, 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 kikis. Lah. After 72 seconds, tinggal 50%. Then go kikis, 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 lagi, tinggal 25%. That's how half life works. It is a constant decaying. Okay, not one time boom, one time boom like that. No. Okay, I tell you what, the number of students that have come up to me and said, oh, really, ah, 
oh, that means one time boom, one time boom. No, it's not. It slowly decay until it becomes 50%. That amount of time will always be the same. Okay? Because that's how radioactivity works. Okay? Right. Question number two. Half-life of iodine 131 is eight days. Okay? That means every eight days is going to reduce to become half. So the original sample is 64 grams. Okay, determine the mass of iodine that has decayed and has not decayed after 24 days. Now think about it. Huh? If the half-life is 8 days, after 24 days is how many half-lives? 8 times 3 is 24. So we're talking about 3 half-lives. Okay, so let's do 3 arrows. 64 originally. The first arrow after 64 becomes 32. After the second one becomes 16. And after the last one becomes 8. So we find that the mass of iodine that has not decayed is 8 grams, which is this last. Okay, so how much has decayed? In 24 days from 64 to become 8, 64 to become 8 is 64 minus 8, which is 56. Okay, I like to use this arrow arrow because it is a very clear picture to me. Okay, if you really want, you can put here like eight days, eight days, eight days until you reach 24 days. Okay, so understanding how half-life works and understanding how the question, what the question wants, is a very important aspect okay, for us to get these calculations correct. Actually, it's not that difficult. The only difficult part is we need to remember that it is always being halved. Okay, but the time is always the same. Every arrow is the same amount of time. The only thing that changes is the numbers. Okay, it always becomes half, 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 half. Okay. All right. Next, a sample of lead 211 of mass 96 grams, okay, has a half-life of 36.1 minutes. Okay, so again, what fraction of the sample has not decayed after 108.3 minutes? Okay, let's forget about the fraction first. Let's talk about this. 108.3 minutes. If the half-life is 36.1, how many times of the half-life until we get 108.3? Okay, so we experiment. Lah. Okay, 36.1 times 2, we get only 72.2. So, belum lagi. So, 36.1 times 3, then we get 108.3. So, that means you need to have 3 half-lives. So, original is 96. 96, 1 half-life, 2 half-lives, 3 half-lives, then it's 108.3 minutes. Okay, let's fill in the numbers. 96 divided by 2. Sorry, my mind is not working today. It's 48. Okay, 48 divided by 2 is 24. 24 divided by 2 is 12. Okay, so the question is asking, uh, so we know that, okay, originally it's 96 grams. After 108.3 minutes, yang tertinggal uh, is 12 grams. Okay, the question is, what fraction of the sample has not decayed? And since it is a fraction, this will be 12 out of how much originally? 96. Okay, which is equals to 1 over 8. Okay, so this is another way the question can be worded. But the basic premise is still the same. We still want to know how much has not decayed. Cuma jawapan ahli kita bagi dalam fraction sahaja. Okay, we give it only in fraction. Question B. What is the mass of the decayed product after this period of time? After 108.3 minutes, we find that the mass of the decayed products are yang sudah decay. Okay, so it will be 96 minus 12. Because 12 yang belum decay. This one is still intact. Okay, so yang sudah decay will be 96 minus 12, which will give you 84 grams. Okay, which is as written over here lah. So, understanding the question, okay, also is another very important part uh, of understanding how this calculation works. Okay, question four. The figure shows the decay curve for a radioactive sample. So, what is the half-life of the sample? Mm -hmm. Now, in order for us to know what's the half-life, we have to know how much originally. Okay, now originally is 1,600. So, 1,600... After one half life, okay, it's supposed to be what? It's supposed to be 800. Then we look for 800 over here. Eh, 
Alamak, there's two 800s. Okay, let's ignore this. I don't need 800. Okay, so it is 25 minutes. Okay, we need to know how much we have originally. Otherwise, we don't know. Okay, state the value of T. Yeah? Okay, the value of T will be, okay, T will be when it becomes 200. Okay, so let's half this until we get 200. 1,600, half is 800. 800 divided by 2 will become 400. 400 divided by 2, then we find that we have left 200. So there's three half-lives. Okay, since one half-life is 25 minutes, 25, 25, 25. So the amount of time over here will be 75 minutes. Okay, is that all? Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to show you four sample questions and how the concept of half-life works. Okay, as long as you remember, okay, and you hold on uh, to these three very important things. Half-life is the amount of time, okay, required for the mass, the activity, the counts per second, the number of nuclei, the percentage, okay, of a radioactive substance to become half of the original value. So the two important things that you need to know is what is the half-life and what is the original value. Then you can do the rest of the questions. Okay, actually it's not uh, that difficult. It just requires us to remember, uh, okay, if anything, uh, remember that the decay series is a geometric progression. So it will never be minus, minus, minus. It's always times half, times half, times half. Okay, that's the second part of our webinar today. Uh. Okay, I'm just going to see if we have any questions. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. We have one very active person in our broadcast. Uh, okay, so Tom is saying Half Life New Game came out. Sorry, I didn't know. Okay, so if you keep halving it, then you cannot end. That's true. Okay, that's why the curve, uh, okay, it will never, it will never totally be zero. It'll be zero point zero zero, but it will still be there. Okay, it will still be there. It's an infinite series, correct? Okay, there's no zero. All right, thank you for the question. All right, let's go on to the last part. Okay, this last part is mostly just uh, talking, talking, talking. Lah. Okay, so, but I want to cover this because it's a very simple uh, subtopic. Okay, so this last part uh, is the uses of radioisotopes. Okay, but in order for us to remember this, we need to talk about what isotopes are first. Lah. Okay, uh, hold on. Uh. Okay, I'm going to end this for a while. So, in the beginning, uh, when we were talking about this, we said that isotopes are, let me see, that, this one. Okay? Oh, sorry. Okay, so we were talking that isotopes are these, uh, isotopes are atoms with the same proton number, but different nuclear number. Okay, but... Not all isotopes uh, are radioisotopes. Okay, so now this is where we combine both together. Okay, radioisotopes are isotopes that are radioactive. Basically, uh, okay, basically saying uh, radioisotopes are isotopes that are radioactive, which brings us to this one. Okay, since we're talking about radioactivity, I'm not interested in what the different kinds of, you know, the different, different kinds of isotopes. Uh, okay, I only want to specifically talk about radioisotopes. Okay, so radioisotopes uh, are unstable isotopes which decay and give out radioactive emissions. Okay, for example, like yes, the other day we were talking about uranium-238 and then there's uranium-234. Okay, there are different, different uh, isotopes. Okay, but radioactive isotopes okay, are called radioisotopes. Okay, so they are unstable isotopes which decay and give out radioactive emissions. Okay, another definition that you can use, they are isotopes of an element that are radioactive. Basically, campuran lah, radio is radioactive isotopes. Okay, but don't say lah, radioisotopes are radioactive isotopes. It's like a no-brainer kind of definition. Okay, try to be as specific as you can. Okay, there are isotopes which decay and they are unstable. They give out radioactive emissions. Sounds much nicer. Okay, radioisotopes are naturally occurring or they can be artificially produced. Okay, if you dwell into this world of radioisotope, radioisotopes, uh, okay, you find that actually sometimes you can 
uh, artificially produce it because not all radioisotopes are natural. Okay, so how do we produce it is when certain nuclides are bombarded by high energy particles. Okay, for example, artificial radioisotopes. Uh, one of one of you okay was sharing with a, a group of us about how uh, how a certain uh, nuclear material uh, called thorium uh, okay how uh, how it was bombarded by high energy particles no sorry uranium okay uranium uh, how how do they bombard it by high energy particles in order for it to be uh, you know to be able to be used uh, for for powering uh, nuclear reactors. Okay, I was an interesting video. Uh, you know, it talks about uranium, but I can't remember what is the word called. Uh, okay, they did something to the uranium because or in uranium in its natural element uh, is not able to be used to uh, it cannot be used to you know to power nuclear reactors. It's not effective enough. So we have to give them some kind of you know, there's to be some kind of bombardment of high energy particles, then it will become excited and then uranium will be able to do its job. It's a very interesting video, okay? I need to show it to you uh, one day, okay? All right, so I'm just going to briefly talk about this. Uh, this will come up in your lesson, but it's good for us to know, okay? Uh, please don't ask me whether this will come out in the exam at all, okay? It has come out quite a number of times in the exam, okay? Uh, especially in uh, paper one, so it's good for us to know. And even if it's not, it is always good information for us to know uh, in real life. Okay, so smoke detectors, uh, guys, smoke detectors uh, that we have in our buildings, okay, are actually an application of radioisotopes. Okay, we find that it contains a weak radioactive source such as americium-241. It's very weak, lah. okay, but the alpha particles that are emitted from the source. Again, uh, we use alpha particles because, number one, they are the weakest in terms of penetrating power and they are the highest in terms of ionizing power. So it's not so dangerous to humans. Okay, but it still can do its job. Okay, so the ionized air molecules. The ionized air molecules conduct electricity and a small current flows through the smoke detector. So when smoke goes inside, okay, the alpha particles will ionize the smoke. It basically works like a spark counter. Okay, so you know when the alpha particles, they ionize the, the, the smoke, huh? then because the smoke becomes iron, Ion, sorry, ion. I always say ion, sorry, ion. Uh, okay, when the smoke particles become ion, they can conduct electricity, and that's where you get the alarm from the smoke detector. Okay, de -de 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 -de. okay so, uh, and this, uh, this one, uh, this is the important one. The soot particles in the smoke absorb some of the alpha particles. Okay, because I remember a student once asked me, uh, so if like that, uh, how come the normal air that go inside the smoke detector cannot, uh, cannot ionize? Okay, it's a combination. Now, uh, this is probably why we use americium. Okay, and also how the smoke detector works are uh, in that the americium only will ionize the soot. Okay, the habuk habuk lah. Okay, the habuk particles in the smoke and not just the air around us. Otherwise, uh, otherwise all the smoke detectors are uh, it will not be smoke detectors. It will be air detectors be, because it will always ionize the air, but it doesn't work that way. Uh. Okay, and the other good thing about americium is that it has a very long half life. Okay, it's about 460 years uh, for it to become half of the original value. Okay, so I have, ne I have yet to meet anybody uh, who say, Oh, okay, I need to change the radioactive substance in my smoke detector. Very, very rarely. Usually, the smoke detector will rose up because you know of either kurang battery la, or you know something happens to the circuitry, la, but not really so much on. Uh, the on the radioactive source, okay, because it's a very long half life, okay, four hundred and sixty years now, baru it becomes half of the original value, so it's very 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 useful, okay, to uh to become in smoke detectors, okay, so that's one, another example of use is thickness control, okay, you know the A four paper right, okay, how is it now uh, that it can be you know the eighty gram is thicker than the seventy gram so, you know what? Somebody press the paper and think, oh, okay, this is 80 gram. Oh, this, no, it's not. Nah. Okay, we use radiation. Okay, we use radiation uh, to help us detect the thickness. Okay, so a radioactive sends radiation through the sheet of material as it comes off production line. Now, we use beta because we cannot use alpha. Alpha can be stopped by paper. Then no point. 
Okay, we use beta because beta can, uh, you know, can go through the paper. But if the paper becomes too thick, okay, then the beta, then the detector will not be able to read. So a radiation detector on the other side measures the intensity of the radiation passing through the sheet. The amount of radiation received by the detector depends on the thickness of the rubber sheet. Okay, it can be rubber sheet, it can be paper sheet, it can be aluminum sheet. Okay, now if the sheet is too thin, the reading of the detector will increase. Okay, because you know, a lot of beta particles pass through. A signal is sent from the roller control to the rollers so that the pressure on the sheets can be reduced. See, so originally, uh, the sheets, uh, whether it is aluminum sheet or rubber sheet or paper, uh, okay, originally is this thick. After it passes through these uh, rollers, okay, then it will be uh, it will be flattened. But well, we want it to flatten uh, to a certain thickness. Okay, and that's where the radiation comes in. Okay, now please, uh, after this, don't go and, you know, kacham all the paper, paper, you know, say, oh, ma, ooh, there's radiation in the paper, don't touch the paper, don't touch the paper. Okay, you think it's what, COVID-19? Uh? No, it doesn't work that way. Okay, the radiation just passes through the paper. Okay, so don't worry about it. Yeah, I've seen people, after they listen to this one, then some people be so paranoid, they don't touch any more A4 paper in their life. Okay, no, it doesn't work that way, okay? The radiation just passes through just to make sure that the thickness is fine. Okay, and usually we use beta particle because the beta particle uh, can pass through paper and aluminum and rubber uh, of a certain thickness. Lah. Okay, of course, if you want a thicker, if you want a thicker rubber or thicker uh, uh, aluminum sheet, uh, then you have to use gamma, but we definitely don't use alpha. Lah. Okay, because alpha, one thin paper so can stop with it, no point. Okay, so it cannot help us to control the thickness of the material that we want. Okay, now I'm sharing this. Uh, this one I know, we're talking about rubber sheet, but actually it also works for aluminium. It also works for detecting the thickness of paper sheet. Okay, and that's how, guys, we can differentiate uh, between 70 gram and 80 gram paper. Of course, you know, kalau kita pegang, we can feel lah. Okay, but that's only one piece of paper. No? Imagine if you have to do one whole rim. Uh, Okay, so that's how, sorry, that's how radioactive, uh, radio, radioactive material is useful for us. Okay, thirdly, uh, to detect leaks in underground water pipes. Okay, so this has happened many times. Uh, if our underground water pipes suddenly burst, bahkan, okay, where are you going to dig uh, to find the, the leakage? You can't be digging the entire road. Okay, it doesn't make sense. So this is where radiation helps us. So a radioactive substance which emits a beta particle is added to a fluid in a pipeline. Okay, so we put, uh, you know, uh, the radioactive substance in there. So the radiation produced by the radioactive substance can be detected with a GM tube counter placed above the ground. So if there is a leak, huh, we find that the water will come out, and then over here the radiation will be much higher than over here. Okay, so a larger increase in the count rate will indicate that there's a leak in the area. It means over here, yang kamu kena correct. Okay, because wow, high level of radioactivity. Okay, now I have noticed uh, that this uh, slide tells us beta particles. Okay, but I think uh, there is also a possibility that uh, gamma, uh, sorry, uh, radioactive substance uh, which emits gamma, okay, is more suitable since our pipes uh, are mostly made of, you know, very, very thick. Uh, material okay so uh, thick metal uh, okay which maybe a uh, beta particle cannot pass through okay so i would say that this uh, diagram is a little bit more accurate than this one uh. okay i if i if it were me i would uh, i would inject the water pipeline with a radioactive substance that has a very short half-life okay but emits gamma radiation short half-life so that you know the faster faster you will decay 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 as it become Know, not zero, but you know, as little as possible in the shortest amount of time. Because if you use something with a very long half-life, uh, then people who drink this water uh, are going to be very, drink this water or use this water for whatever purposes uh, are going to be affected by it. Okay, because the you know the radioactive substance is still going to be there. Okay, but this is how we use uh, the radioactive substance to detect leaks in underground water pipes. Okay. All right, next is in the medical field, okay? In the medical field, we generally use uh, radio, radioisotopes uh, for number one, radioactive traces. 
Okay, so nuclear medicine is a branch of medicine that uses radiation to provide information about the function of a specific organ or to treat the disease. Lah. Okay, tracers uh, are basically, okay, you want this to go to this place to see, okay, whether your whether your lymph node, sorry, your lymph node, whether your pancreas is working or your digestive system is working. Okay, so a radioisotope is taken in by a patient through the digestive system, either by inhalation or through the blood vessels by injection. Okay, so when we inject ourselves uh, with the radioisotope, then it flows through the blood. Lah. So the radiation emitted enables organs such as thyroid, bones, heart, liver to be easily imaged by the imaging equipment. Okay, then if there are any disorders, it can be detected. Of course, uh, when we talk about radioactive tracers, we also have to talk about the half-life. Uh, which half-life is suitable for radioactive tracers? Okay, basically what we want to do is we want to image, you know, we want to get an image uh, of your organ. So we don't want uh, the tracer to have a very long half-life, otherwise it's going to stay in your body for a very long time. Okay, we want it to be a short time, but not too short. Lah. Okay, if let's say uh, the half-life is, 20 seconds, uh, every 20 seconds is going to decay to become half, then by the time it reaches your organ, then finish already, uh, not, not finished, uh, very little left. Okay, so we don't want it to be too short, but it cannot be too long. We cannot have a half-life uh, of 8 years, Okay, which means uh, the thing is going to be in your body for a very, very long time. Okay, you will create a lot of suffering okay, on you. And usually the radioactive traces are, you know, beta or gamma, uh, slightly stronger penetrating power, not alpha. Okay, so, and but we know that beta and gamma is actually very dangerous to us, especially gamma. Okay, uh, but sometimes in order for us to image this, I think most people will use beta. Lah. Okay, uh, it is still safer than gamma, okay, but uh, depending on the situation as well. Lah. Okay, another use for it is for sterilizing. Okay, we use gamma rays usually because gamma rays can be used to kill bacteria, mold, and insects in food as well as medical instruments. Okay, so they are sterilized after packing by a brief exposure to gamma rays. Okay, just to kill off all the bacteria. And that's how we use it. Okay, but probably the most famous use uh, for radioisotopes in the medical field is for cancer treatment. Okay, which is why if you are a cancer if you're a cancer patient uh, and you go through chemotherapy or the other one is called radiotherapy, uh, okay, uh, it is usually this lah, okay, because we use gamma rays. So gamma rays can kill living cells and they are also used to kill cancer cells without having to resort to surgery. Okay, because sometimes cancer cells can grow and they can grow in places that are very hard for the surgeons uh, to, you know, to cut it off uh, by using surgery. So there's no other way except uh, to use radiotherapy. Lah. Okay? But this is a very, very, uh, this is, a, not to say very dangerous, lah. this is kind of like a last resort. Kalau betul-betul tidak boleh sampai sudah at the cancerous part, nah. okay? and they cannot cut it using uh, you know, normal surgery, they will have to use radiotherapy. The bad part about radiotherapy is that in order for us to kill the cancer cells, we will also kill the living cells around it lah. Okay, at the same time. Which is why a lot of doctors, uh, they will use this as a very last resort. Kalau betul-betul, like, you know, no choice lah. Okay, then they will have to use uh, radiotherapy. Okay, not only is it expensive, but it is also dangerous to the patient lah. Okay, because you need the living cells, the good cells, uh, you need the good cells to survive. But you also have to kill off the cancerous cells. Okay, so, you know, in that respect, that's why... Um, the doctor usually leaves it up to the patient lah, to decide whether he wants to go through with, uh, with radiotherapy. Because not everybody can, you know, can tahan radiotherapy. Lah. You know, it makes you vomit, it makes you nauseous. Uh, uh, in Sabah, okay, especially in KK, lah, I know the radiotherapy center is in the Likas Hospital. Okay, and, uh, you know, maybe... It, I mean, I mean, if you want to know more about radiotherapy, you should ask somebody that's working over there. Lah. Okay, or ask people who have been cancer patients. If you know somebody who has a cancer survivor or is actually a cancer patient right now, you know, uh, don't go and suggest, uh, please, uh, don't go and suggest to the person, uh, why don't you try radiotherapy? No, it's just, you know, maybe talk to the person uh, whether they have gone through radiotherapy before. Ask them on their experience. You know, see, ask them how it feels like uh, to go through radiotherapy. You'll be surprised and 
hopefully it inspires you, uh, you know, to that why well, people can survive cancer, you know, uh, there must be some very strong will to live. Like. Okay, because radiotherapy is really no joke. Okay, well, serious discussion for the day. All right, our last part, uh, okay, is this tool. Okay, in terms of agriculture, we use radioactivity. By measuring the radioactivity of the stem and the leaves, scientists can find out how much fertilizer has been absorbed by the plant. Okay, and sometimes we use radioisotopes to kill pests and parasites and to control the ripening of fruits. Okay, so, uh, yeah, transfer radio nucleus to plants. Uh, so we use this in agriculture to see, you know, whether the fertilizer is being absorbed by the plant. Okay, by either, uh, I think it's also in the same way as we uh, use tracer uh, for medical purposes. Okay. Now, lastly, uh, probably the most famous use uh, for uh, for radioisotopes, uh, okay, is in the field of archaeology. Okay, how do people know? Uh, let's say, uh, if they dig, 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 dig up the bone, uh, then they want to know how old is this bone. How is it that people can know uh, that? Oh, okay, it is seventy-five million years old, uh, or only two years old. This bone yesterday, and you just eat the chicken and you throw away. Okay. So how do people know uh, is by okay um this method uh, is called carbon dating okay oh, sorry carbon okay carbon dating uh. carbon dating uh, I tell you when I when I first thought this word carbon dating uh, they actually thought that the carbon 12 and carbon 14 were dating okay like I tell you all this hopeless romantics it's, uh, it's not that kind of dating okay it's dating as in pentarikan dalam bahasa melayu uh, it's called pentarikan carbon okay mengasih tarikh okay putting a date using carbon okay but we're not using c12 uh, okay originally carbon is carbon 12 okay but we're using an isotope of carbon which is carbon 14 and we find that carbon 14 is a radioisotope it is an isotope which is radioactive Okay, so carbon-14 is a radioisotope with a half-life of 5,730 years. It's a very, 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 very old, okay, uh, very long half-life, okay, and decays by emitting beta particles, mostly. Lah. Okay, living animals and plants have a known proportion of carbon-14 in their tissues, which remains constant, okay, for us, all of us also, okay, we have some carbon-14 in us. But because the decay uh, is so slow and it takes so long, we hardly feel the effects. Lah. Okay, plus it is beta particle. Lah, okay, so the, well, when living things die, the amount of carbon forty in their body decreases at a known rate. Okay, so the amount of carbon forty left in a decayed plant or animal can be used to tell its age. Okay, so so you know archaeologists or scientists work their way back. Okay, by using a certain formula. To predict uh, how old a certain bone is. Okay, and we call this as carbon dating. Okay, so these are the uses of some radioisotopes. I'm not going to cover all. Okay, there's actually a lot more in your book. And uh, in the module that I will give you later, okay, there is also some. Uh, okay, but I think it is good for us to, to pay attention to this part. Uh. I, a lot of people I know uh, they just skip over this part because in any bacha saja basanang saja so tiada pengiraan. But actually, you know, I find that learning about the users of radioisotope is actually more interesting than the calculation. Okay, because you see how radioisotopes are used in real life. And as I said, uh, this is not an extensive list now. Okay, this is just a very brief list because I don't take this lecture for too long. But, you know, it's good for us to know this. In smoke detectors, thickness control and uh, underground water pipes, these are famous. Okay, if you're talking about exam questions, these are famous exam questions. Okay, the other one, of course, uh, is in cancer treatment and then for medical field and then of course for archaeology lah, okay in carbon dating a lot of questions in the exam will usually come up you know along these industries or along these users okay but don't limit yourself to this if you're interested in radiotherapy sorry if you're interested in radioactivity it's always good to know how uh, how radioisotopes are used okay how radioisotopes are used uh, in many many other situations Okay, our book is very limited now uh, if you want to write everything uh, okay all the users uh, then there's going to be not enough books uh, for us to this one uh. okay all right yes correct the word is enriched uh, yeah so we were talking about uranium how originally uranium 
uh, is not able to be used uh, for to power up nuclear power. Uh, sorry, nuclear reactors. So we enrich the uranium, okay, by changing it into an isotope, and then after the uranium is enriched, huh, then uh, it will be useful for a nuclear reactor. Okay, uh, any questions from anybody? I think we'll just uh, give you some time to ask any questions uh, before I show you what you will need to do in your Google Classroom. Yeah, there's a 10 second delay, so I don't know whether you already asked me. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now if there's no questions, I uh, just have one short, one last thing, okay, that I need to show you before we, uh, before we end for the day. Okay, uh, whether you're in S1 or S2, uh, I just want to show you, uh, okay, number one, you have a quiz, okay, on Kahoot, once again, that you need to complete before Monday, okay? When I say before Monday, I mean before Monday, 12 a.m., which is alias Sunday night. Okay, please complete this. Make sure you turn it in uh, for your Kahoot quiz. It will cover everything from 5.1 to 5.3. That's about 25 questions altogether over there. Okay, don't worry. There's no timer, so you can take your time and answer this question. Secondly, also by the 12 a.m. on 13th of April, I want you to either print out a copy of this or just write down the answers on a full sketch paper. Okay, now I want to, I want to ask for your cooperation uh, in this matter. Wow, who has turned in this? So hey, but oh okay. So uh, I want to ask for your cooperation now. Uh, okay, for this uh, please if you're going to use multiple pieces of paper, okay, I want to suggest that you use cam scanner, scan all the pages, and then put it into one PDF. Uh one PDF um yeah, put it into one PDF file. Okay, so that it is easier for me to Oh, sorry. Uh, so that it is easier for me to mark. Okay, because if you put it into many, 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 uh, many, many pictures, then it's very difficult for me to see. Uh, let me see. Okay, I'm going to take, for example, Alicia Rand's one. I don't know whether this is still here. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, so if you put it into one PDF, okay, you scan everything, you put it into one PDF, right? then it's easy for me to scan and to give my comment. Okay, if you do multiple, multiple, then every single picture I will have to show and I will have to, you know, I have to, I have to click and I have to load and I have to do So it takes up a lot of my time. Okay, so uh, please learn how to use Cam Scanner. Okay, Cam Scanner is a life-saving app. Okay, use Cam Scanner to scan everything into, uh, into one, uh, one PDF. Okay, and then upload the PDF. If you don't like to use Cam Scanner, uh, then use any. Any picture to PDF, um, yeah, picture to PDF, huh? okay, or JPEG to PDF uh, app. Okay, JPEG to PDF app. Uh, it's fine. I use Cam Scanner because well, it's free and you know I just want to set it as PDF, so I I don't want to have all the the fancies and everything, huh? Okay, but any JPEG to PDF uh, app will do. Okay, so uh, if there's nothing else. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our class. I see there's about 40, 40 or so people. Okay, that's good enough for me. Uh, for those of you who have not finished your homework from the previous lesson, uh, oh, I already gave it back all to you. Lah. Okay, so never mind. All right. So uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, I will see you all. Uh, I will give out the schedule for the next uh, physics lesson uh, later. Okay, and then I will let you know. Or for those of you who are joining the admits class tomorrow, same time, lah. Okay, same time at 10 a.m. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good day. See you.